Uh, today, as you're all aware, it is our national holiday. There's nowhere else to be. All restaurants are closed. Shopping centers are closed. So we have nothing else to do other than come here and inshallah ta'ala, not only increase our iman by praying together, by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also by educating ourselves as Muslims about what we believe, especially for our youth, our children, they need to know this. What do we believe about Isa, Jesus? And what do we do as Muslims when a person we're, we're also respecting and venerating, Jesus Christ, he is being celebrated, but in a way or a manner that we don't agree with. So today I wanted to therefore talk very plainly, very boldly about how Muslims should view this celebration of Christmas. And of course, primarily, as you know, this is really meant for primarily our youth, but inshallah, everybody will be, inshallah, educated and learn something about today's, uh, today's festival. Now, of course, for us as Muslims, the key question is as follows. This is the question. We all know Jesus, Isa, did not preach anything of what modern Christians believe about him. Jesus never taught the Trinity. Jesus never taught redemption. Jesus never taught the 25th of December as his holy day and festival. Yet, the bulk of those who follow him are believing and doing things that he did not do. So we as Muslims should understand and learn where is this coming from? Where, what is the origin of these ideas, these beliefs? And obviously, Today's 20-minute lecture is not going to be a full you know, survey. That's, that would take many, many dissertations, many, many lectures. And there are many books out there. I'll recommend one of them, inshallah, today. But very briefly, just so that we understand what is going on. We, of course, believe Isa, his Arabic name is Isa, his Aramaic name is Isa, and, of course, it, is, it has been Latinized to Jesus. If you call Jesus Jesus, he wouldn't even recognize the name because the Ja letter did not exist in his language. He never called himself Jesus. This is a Latinized, uh, a, a, a Latinized transliteration of Esau. Esau is most likely how he pronounced it in Aramaic and in Arabic, Isa. So we all believe that Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, was one of the most blessed human beings to ever walk the face of this earth. We believe he was one of the mightiest prophets. We believe Allah chose him. We believe that out of the five greatest messengers, our Prophet and Jesus are amongst them. And we believe that the Prophet Jesus had one speciality no other human being had at all. And that is he was the only human being to be born without any male intervention. No male intervention. And the mother who gave birth to him, we also believe as Muslims, she was the most pious lady in all of human history. She's so pious, the Quran mentions her by name and does not mention any other woman by name. The Quran does not mention any other lady by name. She's so holy. There is a whole chapter of the Quran, chapter 19 called Maryam. So Mary, Maryam, and of course even Mary is an Anglicized, Latinized. Her name was Miriam or Maryam. Uh, uh, the Aramaic would be Miriam or Maryam. And uh, of course Mary is again the Latinized version. We believe that Maryam was the most pious lady to ever walk on the face of this earth, and she was raised in the temple. She was raised in the temple of Suleiman, the, 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 on what we now, of course, the Masjid al-Aqsa, is that which is holy for all of us. It was holy because Allah made it holy. She was raised there as a child. Her whole life, she was worshiping Allah. She never lived and interacted with society. She was raised as a worshiper, and her whole life was just ibadah. And the Quran tells us that there was no need to even bring food. Allah would feed her directly. When her uncle Zakaria would bring food to feed her, lo and behold, there would already be beautiful, sumptuous food over there. And Zakaria would ask, where is this food coming from? And Maryam would say, Allah just gave it to me. It's right there. It's not even something that she needed to have. So in this story, as we know, Isa was born a miraculous birth. Maryam was shocked, how am I going to give birth? I have never been married, I've never been with a man. And Allah said through Jibreel that this is the decree of Allah. Kun fayakun. You will give birth without any male intervention. So she leaves the town because she doesn't want people to suspect or what is going on with her pregnancy. She leaves the town, she gives birth, and then she comes back into Jerusalem. And she has the baby. 
And the priest recognized, this is Maryam who we raised in our temple. The priest recognized, what are you doing with the baby? And they said, your family is a holy family. We never have thought that you would give birth outside of marriage. How can you have a child outside of marriage? And because Allah had told her through Jibreel, you're not allowed to speak, she could do nothing other than point to the heaven and to the baby, meaning Allah gave me the baby, but she couldn't say anything more. And they didn't get the sign. I mean, how would we get such a sign? They didn't get the sign. And so Allah blessed Isa with the first of his many, many, many miracles. And of course, that was that he spoke as a newborn. He spoke and he said, Qala inni abdullah atani al kitaba waj'alani nabiyya. He said, I am Allah's chosen servant. He has revealed a book unto me and he has made me a nabi. And waj'alani mubarakan aina ma kuntu. He has made me blessed wherever I go, Allah's blessings will go. Wherever I go, there will be Allah's barakah. And he has commanded me to pray and be generous as long as I live. And to be good to my mother. This is Isa giving a khutbah as a baby. Salah, zakah, kindness to parents. This is generic khutbah across all civilizations and prophets. Salah, zakah, and be good to parents. And then he says, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ And there shall be peace on me the day I was born. This is the real Islamic Christmas. We don't need 25th of December. I'm going to talk about where that came from. We don't need it. Allah has declared the birth of Jesus and the day he was born to be وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ Peace will be on me. This day, the day I was born, there will be salam. And the day I shall die, there shall be salam. And the day I shall be resurrected, Allah's salam will be upon me. And then, of course, we know that Jesus, Isa, preached for around 30 plus years. And what did he preach? He taught the people of Israel, the children of Israel, that unless they repent to Allah, their status in the eyes of Allah would be gone. They had committed too many sins. And Jesus said to them, I am the Messiah. And the Messiah, they were waiting for him. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. What is a Messiah? A Messiah is one whom Allah has chosen. And the Jewish people knew there would be a chosen one. There would be the best of their prophets to come. There would be a prophet like unto David, because David is their main prophet. And like unto David, like unto Moses, there would be somebody coming. And there would be a number of miracles that he would do. When they saw the miracles, they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Jesus. And instead of supporting him, they made up lies. And they caused, they engineered the execution of Jesus in their eyes. They thought they had killed Jesus, but we don't believe this. We believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. But the Quran has a phrase here. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ They neither killed him, nor did they crucify him, now listen to the Quran. But it was made to appear that he had been killed and crucified. This is what the Quran says. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ It was made to appear that something happened and they thought Jesus had been killed and been crucified. And the Quran does not tell us what this means. Later ulama have given interpretations and there are a number of interpretations. We don't want to go into that uh, today. But we firmly believe the message of Jesus was follow the law that Moses gave you, worship your Lord, be pious and righteous. That's it. Nothing else. Jesus did not come with anything that modern Christians believe in that is separate to Judaism. In fact, Jesus was himself a practicing Jewish person. He was circumcised. He ate kosher. He practiced kosher. He practiced Jewish law. He did not work on the Sabbath, which is Jewish law even in our Sharia. Allah says, we ordain for the Jewish people that they must worship on the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath, the Saturday, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to do anything other than worship and dhikr and not do any work, uh, not do anything for your rizq, for your sustenance. You are supposed to take it as a literal holy day. You're supposed to just do ibadah and that's it. And Allah says, we ordained the Sabbath for the Bani Israel. So it's there for them. Jesus himself worshipped the Sabbath. He did not work on the Sabbath and he observed Jewish law. 
How did all of this change? What happened? Very brief summary, and every Muslim should know this. Every Muslim should know this. There are two people you should know that are the primary causes of the corruption of Christianity. And these two people, they helped formulate doctrines that eventually led to what we now do on Christmas. The first of them was Paul. Paul, he is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament because he has authored more than a dozen books of the New Testament. Paul was one of the earliest converts, but he never met Jesus. He never saw Jesus. The actual disciples of Jesus, Paul is after them. He interacted with the disciples. He didn't interact with Jesus. And there is clashes that took place between the actual followers and between Paul. Read your Christian history, you will, uh, early history, you will know this. What did Paul introduce? So how did Paul become famous? Paul said he saw Jesus in a vision on his way to Jerusalem. He saw him in a vision, like he had a live interaction with him in a vision. After Jesus left this earth, Paul said, oh, but I saw him and he told me, you are you know, the apostle I'm sending you. So he proclaimed himself that Jesus chose me. And when he began, came to Jerusalem, he began preaching a different version of Christianity. What did he say? So Paul said, Jesus wasn't just the Messiah for the Jewish people. Jesus was the salvation to all of mankind. This is the fundamental difference. Paul is saying Jesus was sent because Paul was claiming now that Jesus is meant for all of mankind. Whereas Jesus himself and the Quran tells us, I have been sent to the children of Israel. Paul said no, he sent to the Romans as well. And he sent to the Chinese, he sent to the Asian, he sent to everybody. And he came to abolish the law. You don't have to follow halal and haram. There's nothing halal and haram. There's no kosher, no Sabbath, no circumcision. You don't have to do anything of the laws of God. All you have to do is to believe that he came to save you. This is redemption, they call it. So the doctrine of redemption and the abolishment of the law, this is coming from Paul. What happened, I'm being very simplistic here, Christianity split into multiple groups. For our purposes, we'll mention two of them. There's more than two. For our purposes, we'll mention two of them. The first of them is called Pauline Christianity, Paul's Christianity, and the other is called Jewish Christianity. Jewish Christianity is Islam, what we believe. Jewish Christianity is, we are the followers of Moses and Abraham and Jesus. We must follow the laws of God. We must be pious and righteous. We must pray, we must give charity. It's exactly what we believe. And these groups, there were multiple groups, they continued to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and they practiced Judaism. Pauline Christianity began preaching to the Romans and began converting Roman pagans to Christianity. And in the process, a new theology developed. This theology had nothing to do with monotheism. Trinity begins to be introduced. Other gods, there's multiple gods. There's not one that ruled heaven, there are three. And Jesus and God the Father. And in early Pauline Christianity, some groups said, Jesus, Mary, and God the Father are the Trinity. I'm not making this up. Early Christian groups, some of them said, this is the Trinity. And others said, Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And others said others. They had their different interpretations of how, of, of how to understand the Trinity until finally the second major figure comes along, and this is the Roman Emperor Constantine. So Paul, we're talking about around 40, 50 uh, uh, CE, like after Jesus Christ, right, of the Christian era, and then the Emperor Constantine around 300 CE. These are the two figures you need to know. The Emperor Constantine, coming 300 years after Jesus Christ, now you have to realize another thing, a lot of Muslims are not aware of this, Early Christianity was persecuted by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is pagan. They believe in gods, Jupiter and Zeus and all those. Well, Zeus is the, uh, uh, Zeus is the uh, Greek god, but they believe in the uh, uh, Saturn, for example. They believe in uh, uh, the Roman god Jupiter. They have the entire pantheon of gods. And when Christianity comes along, the empire begins to persecute the Christians as heretics. In fact, I recited to you Surat al-Buruj. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes 
torturing of people to death via fire. In the Surah Al-Buruj, Allah describes that they uh, ma- made a big fire and they threw people into it only because they believed in Allah. If you look at the tafsir, this is Allah praising the early true Jewish Christians, the real Christians. They were persecuted for their beliefs and the pagans killed them. One of the worst emperors, his name is Nero, Emperor Nero. Look this up. In one anger uh, fit that he had, he ordered all of the Christians of the city, of the town to be gathered and used them as lanterns at night. Pour oil on them and use them as lanterns, as lights. Literally, this is, and some Mufassirin say, the Quran is referencing that, other Mufassirin say another Christian group was persecuted another time, but the, the reference can apply to both because it talks about burning to death, and the pagans would burn people to death that they considered uh, heretics. So, for 300 years, Christianity was a persecuted religion. Because it was persecuted, the beliefs and the doctrines were not codified. You didn't have famous ulama and theologians writing treatises. It's underground. Because it's underground, Christianity had many weird interpretations because it's a hidden religion. It's not a religion that is public. And this facilitated bizarre beliefs, facilitated beliefs of Pauline Christianity and others. When Emperor Constantine comes to power, Constantine's mother was from this Christian sect, Pauline Christianity. Constantine's mother, his father was a Roman emperor, a pagan. His mother, as you know, the Roman emperor has plenty of wives and mistresses. So this particular lady was a Christian. And he was raised, obviously the father has so many children, he's raised from the mother. And it shows you the influence of the mother here. Constantine was raised by his Christian mother. And when he comes to power, he then makes Christianity the default religion of the Roman Empire. This is a key point in human history. One of the most important historical events we should all be aware of is around 310, 315 CE, not AH, not Hijra, CE. This is 200 years before the process, 250 years before the The Emperor Constantine officially declares that Christianity is the state religion. And this is what provoked a mass conversion across the Roman Empire. Up until 300 CE, the bulk of Roman Empire is paganistic. England is paganistic. Rome itself is paganistic. Europe is paganistic. In 310, or to be more precise, 314 CE, Constantine comes to power, and his most important decision, Christianity is now the religion of the empire. And because he's the emperor, and because the Roman Empire is at its pinnacle, within two, three centuries, paganism had died out. It took a while. There were clashes. Some of the pagans went to war with the Christians. England remained pagan for another two, three, uh, the Nordic countries remained pagan for another 500 years. So it wasn't immediate. It was not immediate. It took three, four, five, six centuries for the clash between idolatry and paganism. Pause here, footnote. How long was the clash between Islam and paganism? How long was the clash? If you want to say 23, you're accurate, but the actual clash, from the conquest of Mecca, basically, until all of Arabia accepting Islam is three years. From the conquest of Mecca until there is no paganism in Arabia, it's three years. In the lifetime of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, paganism is eliminated from Arabia. There are no Arab mushrikun. There are no Arab yani, idol worshippers of Allah and Al-Uzza. They're gone. Our religion took two, three years. Khalas, gone. Christianity took, in some places in Norway, 600 years. The Vikings were pagan. And the Vikings attacked Muslim lands. The Vikings interacted with the sultans. And they're pagan. They're not Christian. This is Norway. They're not Christian. So uh, it took a while for Christianity and paganism to interact with one another, but the main decision was Constantine's. Now, Constantine, what does he do? Constantine had to decide which version of Christianity to follow. Because remember, we said there's multiple versions. You still had, you still had Jewish Christianity, and you had Pauline Christianity, and you had others, I don't want to go there, I mean Gnosticism and others, there are multiple strands. And Constantine decided to convene a group of Christian theologians in 
the land or the city of Nicaea, which is now in modern Turkey. Because Turkey back then, of course, Turkey is a modern name for it. Back then, that land was the bastion of Christianity. Constantinople was the capital, named after himself. He's such a humble guy, he named the city after himself, right? Constantine, Constantinople, Istanbul, that was the capital. And Nicaea is a distance away from there. Constantine called the clerics he wanted to call. And he basically said to them, this is what I want. And they then made forth what is called the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed is the fundamental creed of Christianity that caused all other Christian movements to die out, including Jewish Christianity. What is the Nicene Creed? There are three that rule in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are not three, but one. This is the Nicene Creed. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament as it originally was. This is the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed, then the emperor said, any other version of Christianity shall be persecuted, shall be expelled. So one remnant of that went all the way to Andalus, by the way. And that's why when Islam came to Andalus, they were still following a version of Christianity that was closer to Islam. And that's why so many Muslims and so many people converted in Andalus because they fled the Roman Empire. They fled as far as they could. How far could they go? They went all the way to Spain. And these were the Visigoths. These were, they, they followed what is called Aryan Christianity. And Aryan Christianity is the closest version to Islam. When Islam came to Andalus, Aryan Christianity, Islam is like very similar. And that's one of the reasons why so many Andalusians converted to Islam, but that's another uh, point not related to our talk today. So, so Constantine, what did Constantine introduce? Constantine introduced the Trinity. Even Paul did not introduce the Trinity. Constantine introduced the Trinity. And Constantine introduced Christmas. And Constantine introduced Sunday. All of this is coming from Constantine. What year is this, guys? What year? 325, roughly. 325, 330. Why Sunday? Because in paganism, see, Constantine was his mother's Christian, his father's pagan. So be very simplistic. He's I'm being very simplistic, so an academic would be very angry at me now, but I'm being very simplistic here. He's kind of sort of merging the paganism of his father and the Christianity of his mother. This is too simplistic, but it is also true. It's not untrue. It's factually correct. Because what is he doing? The Trinity is a pagan notion. Not even Paul has the Trinity. Paul does not talk about the Trinity. The Trinity is a pagan notion. Greek paganism and Roman paganism had a Trinity. So Constantine wanted something his people would recognize. Sunday was a holy day for the pagans. That's why it's called Sunday. Sun, meaning sun, and the holy day of the sun. Sunday was the holy day of the Roman Empire. And so it was Constantine who said, for the first time ever, Sunday shall be the holy day for us new Christians. And ever since then, Christianity has said Sunday. Otherwise, before... Constantine, it wasn't Sunday. There was no Sunday. And where did then this, and also, by the way, some of the symbolism of the papacy and the clergy roles and the robes and all that, some of this also comes from that time frame. The liturgies and the, some of the motifs of modern Christianity, it comes from uh, Constantine's uh, time frame. But for our purposes, we're talking about uh, Christmas here. For our purposes, uh, what, did, what did he introduce when it comes to, uh, to Christmas here? Why did he introduce Christmas? So he introduced Christmas because around this time was one of the most popular festivals of the Roman Empire. And it was called Saturnalia, the festival of Saturn. Saturnalia, the festival of Saturn. And it was a festival of gifts and wine and merriment. And it took place around the winter solstice. What is the winter solstice? In the Northern Hemisphere, the shortest day of the year means the longest night. The shortest day of the year is December 21, 22. The shortest day of the year. Right? You all know this, the, uh, the, the, the days and the nights they change. And so in the northern hemisphere, the shortest day is 21st or 22nd. Around this time frame, the Roman pagans would celebrate. Why would they celebrate? That now the sun is becoming stronger. They had this mythology, mythological notion that the sun, 
The sun was a god for them, remember. They worshiped the sun. That the sun comes weak and strong. Weak and strong. That's what they believe. So the winter solstice, the weakness is over and the strength is coming back. And when the sun becomes strong, what happens? The crops will grow and we're going to get food. So they celebrated the coming back of the sun on the winter solstice. And therefore, around this time, December 22nd, 23rd, eventually became 25th. This is why December 25th was decided in this time frame, in Constantine's era. He decided this is going to be the holy day of the year, 25th December. Complete, straight out of paganism, 100%. No Christian before Constantine celebrated the birth of Jesus, much less on the 25th of December. This is completely a pagan idea, a pagan notion that he's now, again, he's trying to bring a hybrid because he wants his people to convert. What's the easiest way to convert? You package something that they understand. So the Trinity, they understand it. And the symbolisms, they understand it. And the Sunday, they understand it. It's the same day. It's just different gods now. You just do the, you, you, you holy day, holy day. And the, the Saturnalia festival, we will convert it into what is now called Christmas. By, by the way, footnote here, uh, not every Christian sect is exact on the date. The time frame is the same, but exact dates are different. So for example, the Armenian church is January 6th, uh, the Oriental Orthodox is January 7th, and the Eastern Orthodox is uh, January 19th. So there's different dates, but the season is the same, i.e. the sun is coming back. The sun is getting stronger. So all Christian groups that celebrate Christmas are actually celebrating the return of the sun and the strength of the sun. Sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N sun, right? Sun, S-U-N, the sun. It goes back to this pagan uh, festival. And Saturn in particular, uh, Saturnalia, Saturn was the god of agriculture for the Romans. Saturn was the god of agriculture. And so that's why the, the, the festival was called uh, Saturnalia. Now, another point that uh, you should be aware of, uh, by the way, before we move on, uh, the book I want to recommend for you is a very important book and it's very easy to read. Very, very educational book before I move on to the issues of, of uh, Christmas. Uh, the best book I can recommend for every person to read uh, is written by Bart Ehrman, B-A-R-T-E-H-R-M-A-N, Bart Ehrman. He's written 12 best-selling books. One of the best ones is How Jesus Became God. You will find it for $5 on Amazon, a used copy. And it's actually very easy language, even though he himself is an intellectual, but he wrote this book for the average Christian, the average person to understand. And his story is also very story, very interesting. And his ideas of Jesus are literally as if they are Quranic, literally. I even asked him, I met him once, I asked him, how do you explain your research and conclusions matches exactly with the Quran? And he didn't have an answer to me. And he just said, oh, well, he didn't have a direct answer to me. I, I, I make dua for him, honestly. He's such a, his research is so close to what we believe. Uh, and it's uh, amazing to me that he hasn't converted yet. Uh, and the Quran actually mentions this reality. What reality? That your version of Christianity is not from Jesus. It's from different people. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ O oh, children of the book, do not exaggerate the status of Jesus in your religion. And don't say about Allah except the truth. Do not follow the false opinions of other people who went astray, took others astray, and they became misguided from the correct understanding. Allah literally calls Christianity the misguided opinions of other people. The Prophet ﷺ was at a time and place, nobody knew this history. Everybody thought Jesus taught Christianity. Everybody thought this. Nobody did the research, it was not there. And Allah says, these ideas are not coming from Jesus. These ideas came from people, they came after Jesus. And they invented these doctrines. And literally, you can pinpoint, now that we have all this information, you can pinpoint this reality. Now, very briefly, before we conclude, because I know, mashallah, all of you are here also for the samosas and chai. I know that as well, inshallah. So let's finish up, inshallah, as well. Very briefly, just out of interesting sake, that, okay, we got the idea of Sunday, where it came from. We got the idea of, of Christmas, where it came from. But how about the motifs? How about the 
symbolisms, the, you know, St. Nicholas or Santa Claus and the elves and all of this. How is this coming about? This is another interesting story. And it shows you that actually modern Christianity is a hodgepodge, a mixture of ancient paganism, European mythology, you know, different things come together. There's nothing of original Jesus. So when Christianity spread to Europe, the Vikings... You all know the Vikings, right? Famous people, right? The Vikings had a whole different mythology than the ancient, the ancient Romans. And of their mythology, the Vikings were uh, Celtic people. They had a whole different mythology, and they believed in the god Odin, god of war. And they had their own uh, you know, sacred symbols. Now, the Vikings believed that the god Odin, during the winter solstice, would actually come to the peoples and give them gifts. And he would use reindeers because they're up in the north, the Vikings. So they had this image of their God and their God, they portrayed him as an old man with a big beard. They portrayed their God as an old man with a big beard. That's our version, the Christian version of Santa Claus. This is where the reindeer comes from as well. Because again, Americans, reindeer, come on, what is reindeer? It's the Nordics. It's the Celts, it's the, 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 the Vikings, right? So when they converted to Christianity, again, they added their twist. And they brought in the god Odin. And they brought in the reindeers. And this became eventually, uh, there was a version of Christianity that they also had their version of, uh, this is getting, I'm, I'm going to confuse you because multiple legends coming together. There was a sect of Christianity that venerated a saint called Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas, and Saint Nicholas was known to be very generous and he would give gifts to the children. So Saint Nicholas becomes Santa Claus, the god Odin becomes the figure, and the reindeer, and all of this put together, along with the 25th winter solstice of, of Constant, Constantine, and slowly but surely this mythology comes up. Now haven't other Christians seen this? Yes, they have, and that is why, very interestingly, that is why a number of early Christians were anti-Christmas. In fact, this is something you should all be aware of. When Europeans first came to this country, our high schoolers know, what version of Christianity did they, did they follow? Which version of Protestant? Puritan England. The Puritans, our high school kids know this. Our uncles and aunties haven't studied, understandably. You have a different, that's fine, that's, that's the way it is. Our high school kids told us the first version of Christianity were the Puritanicals, the Puritans, the most hardcore. They were the ones who founded New England, Massachusetts, what not. In 1659, listen to this, the governor of Massachusetts enacted a law declaring Anybody who celebrates December 25th is going to be fined. Why? Why? Who can tell me why? <laughs> because they said it is a pagan festival. I'm not, you can look this up. The Puritans in Massachusetts, they had a decree because you have to realize, before America was founded, you had the Christians here, and they wanted that portion of land to be hard, strict Christianity. And that's why there were 13 colonies. Every colony had a different stri stripe of Christianity. You would migrate depending on which version of Christianity you followed. Only in the 1770s when the founding fathers said, no, no, we don't want religion. We want it to be a secular state. The actual original people, they had a very strict interpretation. And so the Puritans of Massachusetts were the most hardcore. And they made a law, if you celebrate Christmas, we will fine you, penalize you. Any decoration, it goes into detail. You cannot hang this, you cannot do that. A long detailed list. If you had a Christmas tree in Massachusetts, the police would come and arrest you and fine you. Why? Because this is a pagan festival, has nothing to do with Christianity. I'm not saying this, Puritan said this. So then how did it become mainstream? Well, where did the notion of Saint Santa Claus and whatnot come from? From Northern Europe, from Norway. And that spread to other regions, in particular then Germany. And Germany was the primary place where this notion of 
Christmas and Santa Claus and whatnot comes from. And in fact, one of the uh, main catalysts, believe it or not, very interesting, uh, one of the main catalysts, how it came about, just an inter interesting story, is actually Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Why Queen Victoria? So again, an interesting tidbit here. Queen Victoria and the royal family of England, where are they from? Where is the royal family of England from? England? No, they're not from England. Germany. No, not Scotland. Germany. A lot of people don't know this. The royal house of Windsor, it only changed its name in 1917 because of World War I. In World War I, this is a whole different tangent, but it's interesting, you should be aware of it. In World War I, because the Germans and the British are fighting, the royal family is a German royal family. You know the British royalty, they're all interconnected to one family. Every one of them, they're all distant cousins and whatnot. The, the royal family of England is actually German. Queen Victoria spoke only German for the first part of her life. She did not speak English as her first language. The royal family is German. In 1917, because of World War I, they changed their name from some German name, I forgot, to the House of Windsor to make it sound like British. The House of Windsor is pure German. 100% they are German German. And so Queen Victoria, her festivals are German. And so when she became queen, the, they didn't have photographs. They had um, lithographs, they had paintings, and they had those things that printed in papers. So they made a postcard of her and her husband with all of the kids and their German Christian, you know, um, decoration. Historians say that postcard, I think it was 1840-something, it went viral because it was a very beautiful postcard. You have the queen, you have the, the, her husband, you have all the children, and you had the Christmas tree and you had the gifts. This is when the Christmas tree and the gifts are introduced to the rest of Europe because when the queen does it, Everybody wants to do it, right? And from Queen Victoria, it came all the way to America as well. The Puritans are long gone. This is 1600, now it's 1850. These are modern people. And so slowly but surely, it now spreads, and it is what it is. But still, there are some uh, Christian groups, such as the Quakers, such as the Seventh-day Adventists. They consider Christian Christmas to be a pagan holiday, and they do not celebrate it. And there are many Christian, genuine believing Christians, i.e. they're trying to be pious people, who, who bemoan the fact that Christmas has lost all spirituality. It's just a festival of pleasure, of shopping, of materialism, and there's no spirit of giving to the poor and whatnot, and this is actually a fact. So I want to conclude on this point, and that is, what do we learn as Muslims from all of this? We learn how easy it is that ideas can creep in. And Christmas is actually a mixture of at least four different you know, strands of paganism. At least four, if not more. And slowly, you know, we have the Nordics here, the ancient you know, Romans here, and this there, the Germans here, because I forgot to tell you, the mistletoe is German. The, the mistletoe is the German. The reindeer is Nordic. So everyone has its own little thing coming in. You know, the gifts coming up from here. St. Nicholas is from Turkey, Turkey. I mean, we say he's from Turkey. He's from Anatolia is the term there. So everyone's coming from a different thing, but this is the reality of modern beliefs, which is why we as Muslims, we thank Allah, alhamdulillah, our religion has been preserved. To give you one simple example, Christians were debating who God is in 320 after Jesus Christ. How many gods? Who is? By 300 hijrah, the schools of law are all codified. The books of hadith are all written. The books of tafsir are done. We have no equivalent. Alhamdulillah, our religion has been preserved from the beginning. There was no major controversy over God. To this day, the Muslim ummah does not differ over God. Yes, we differ about the Sahaba. We know this. But can you compare to Christianity? They're differing over who is God, the nature of God, how many gods, who's the third of the Trinity. There is no equivalency, much less God. Our books of hadith and tafsir and fiqh are all compiled by 300 hijrah, whereas Christians don't even know their version of God and holidays and festivals and whatnot. So no wonder when there was so much chaos in the beginning, we have such you know, convoluted ideas that are so far removed from the teachings of Jesus Christ. And therefore, to conclude, we thank Allah we have the truth. And not only that, but we firmly believe that when Jesus comes back to earth, and he will come back to earth, he will recognize his religion and his teachings amongst us. 
and he will recognize us. We are the real followers of Jesus Christ. And every person here, when you meet your Christian friends, you need to say that to them. We are the real followers of Jesus. We love Jesus the way Jesus should be loved. And we genuinely celebrate his birth the way the Quran celebrates it. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أَبْعَثُ حَيَّ We are the followers of all the prophets, including Jesus Christ. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to preach the truth, to allow us to be role models to our fellow colleagues and citizens, to allow other people to see the truth and beauty of our faith. وَجَزَاكُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ فَيَا ذُلِّي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب